Right, we have a hot mic out there for any of you who are yeah. interested in or concerned about. So we'll start here in a minute or so. Let the uh, Zoom participants hold in. Tracy. Uh, yeah, we're at five. They're they're not a lot signed up. So. You're probably good. Okay, we'll get started then. Um, welcome everyone to uh, the October 11th regular board meeting for the Oakwood City Schools Board of Education, um, where we are live from the board office and also live via Zoom as we have been for the past several months. Gina, would you please call the roll? Ms. Starr? Here. Mr. Dua? Here. Mr. Miller? Here. Mr. Schaderman? Here. Mr. Wilson? Here. Everyone, please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please have a motion to adopt this evening's agenda. Second. Gina. Mrs. Ford? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Mr. Jerome? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Jr. Aye. May I please have a motion to approve the minutes from the September 13th, 2021 regular board meeting and the work session meeting? So second. Uh, Jim. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Stevenson? Aye. Ms. Starr? Aye. Mr. Duo? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Okay. Is there any accommodations to public comments? Are there any accommodations? Sure. Great. Uh, we have a, a few guests with us uh, from the Oakwood Schools Foundation. Yep. Here you come. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here to to share uh, some of the great things that are going on with the foundation. Okay, hi, I'm Emma Butler, and I'm the chair of the Oakwood Schools um, Foundation Grants Committee. And this is my colleague, Ashley Coyne, who serves alongside me on the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about our work tonight. Our mission at the Oakwood Schools Foundation is to enhance excellence in education. And our grants uh, to teachers and staff is one of our most direct ways of supporting that mission. I can honestly say that reviewing the applications for the grants and learning more about our teachers' passions and vision for their classes and being able to provide this extra opportunity for our students is one of the most rewarding parts of my work on the board. It was even more rewarding this year as we all return back to semi-normalcy and focus together on providing the best learning environment for our students. So thank you to all the teachers who took the time to apply and to think of new ways to support their classrooms. We also want to thank our grants review committee, which included Roger Crum, Stephanie Campbell, Dan Kugel, as well as Kyle Ramey and Kimby Lang for their thoughtful discussion around each grant application. It is always rewarding to see how every single resident comes together to support our schools and their work. So without further ado, we're excited to present the check tonight um, to the Oakwood Schools on behalf of the Oakwood Schools Foundation and in partnership with the Oakwood Fine Arts Boosters for the fall 2021 grant cycle. The total amount is in excess of $5,000 and will support the following programs. We have two classroom sets of ukuleles for our elementary school <laughs> students at both Harmon and Smith. <laughs> Uh, we have a special guest speaker, Dave Rover, who spoke to uh, about kindness and civics to both the junior high and high school students. 
And we also have brand new cordless microphones for the acapella program at the high school. Um, so now we'll present our check here. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Watch your face. There we go. There we go. So we'll be sharing photos and stories from our grant applicants on our pages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make sure. Sorry, just didn't hold on. Didn't hold a rowdy. All right, now you. Right. Right. Make sure to visit, um, visit our website and follow us on Facebook. Um, we'll be showing pictures of all these things. And finally, we'll be looking forward to talking to you again in February after our winter grant cycle. Great. Thank you. So our Open School Foundation is really a, a great partner in what we do. Uh, the Flourish campaign just got kicked off uh, about the Arts Enhancement Program. And I'm sure some of you have heard about or we're seeing that a great opportunity for our students, again, privately funded to enhance our arts, and we're excited about that. Uh, a couple more commendations. Uh, congratulations to the uh, sixth uh, Oakwood High School National Merit Semi-Finalist. Uh, we're excited about that, and uh, that's always a great thing for the National Merit Scholars and for the scholarship. Uh, congratulations also to Dan Shaw. I think I saw Dan back there. Uh, Back, uh, Dan, uh, with Shared, Shared Resource Center, now Bradley Payne Advisors received the Dick Maxwell School Finance Award from the State Association of the State Superintendent Association. Uh, that was awarded just this past week to him, and uh, he gave a great uh, thank you speech and did a really nice job. So thanks, Dan, and congratulations. That's, that's good stuff. <laughs> Also, uh, Oakwood High School Athletic Hall of Fame Committee is pleased to announce the 2021 class of Oakwood Athletic Hall of Fame. So they did their 2021 induction just about a month ago, and that was because COVID had canceled it last time. So this is the uh, group where they're trying to get back on schedule, so they're going to do another one in January, on January the 28th. Uh, the following will be inducted uh, Jim Reston. Tom Blitzkrieger, Bobby uh, Brundage, and Wendy McElwain will be inducted in the Athletic Hall, I think, as a class of 2021. Oh, I missed it. Oh, and Jen Lohmeyer. Jen Lohmeyer and the uh, uh, 1972 wrestling team. Sorry. Didn't look the page. Congratulations to them. Great. Thanks, Dr. Ramey. Public comments, we have three. Uh, we'll take them in the order that we received them, or at least that I think we received them. Um, and for clarity to two of you tonight, Tom and Sean, I think the form marked up three minutes, but I think we talked to Jenny about having five, so to be equitable, we're gonna do five minutes for each. I'll, uh, I'll keep time and try to give you a heads up, maybe about 45 seconds before, so that you know your time's running short. Um, and we'll go from there. So Tom, you're first up. All right. Well, thank you uh, for hearing me tonight. Uh, you know, I reached out to some of you here uh, for feedback on the EDI plan, and I wasn't getting uh, all the answers, and so I thought I would come and speak tonight. Uh, I am one of a growing group of Oakwood citizens who are concerned that the focus of schools has shifted away from academic excellence and towards social indoctrination through the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusive Plan uh, posted on the school website and related resources page. The Oakwood Register published my letter to the editor this week seeking clarity on topics like gender and critical race theories being pushed by leftist activists and now being assessed for adoption in our schools. I made a clarion call to the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose work led to the end of Jim Crow laws and racism that plagued our country for a century following the Civil War. I'm sure you know that Dr. King was a devout Christian man and pastor and his faith drove him to speak uncomfortable truths in his day. Christianity is ultimately connected to understanding the deepest truths of the world around us and applying that knowledge to the problems of the day. Dr. King appealed to this natural law philosophy to argue against the evils of racism. And along with thousands of years of tradition, natural law provides the basis for Christian promotion of societal goods like strong marriages and healthy relationships when discussing human sexuality. 
I am deep, deeply concerned that Oakwood schools are becoming less welcoming to the inputs of Christians and other concerned citizens in the community with the shift toward the EDI program. Referring specifically to the pushback against the LGBT agenda on display on the school's website, now on the resources page, Board of Education candidate Lauren Kawai stated on her Facebook page that Christians are, quote, more than welcome to enroll your child in a different school that aligns better with your values. She also mocked parents concerned about protecting their children's, quote, innocence and heterosexuality. This is bigotry and an inability to engage respectfully with a diverse array of ideas, not the words of someone who is genuinely interested in what is best for our children. Current board member John Wilson is on record saying he shares his values with Lauren, which is why I am bringing this up at this forum. I would like to know where the board and our superintendent stand on these issues. And I'm proud to stand with Dr. King and speak with clarity and truth against the politically powerful ideologies of our day. I think some important voices have been left out of the EDI discussion, and we are ready to engage charitably and work for the good of our children and our community. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Sean, is it power? It is. Hey, Sean, you got five minutes. So if I stand here, I'm gonna block the camera. So maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm on board. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for giving us a little extra time because trying to practice something that you want to speak, you did it in three minutes, is really really hard. Um, also, let me just say that it was a real treat to be in the working session. Really wish more of our parents could um, do that. I don't know if that's something that's also available on, online. But I find that very informative, very, very informative. And uh, Dr. Raymond, really appreciate a lot of comments there. And especially uh, in terms of asking for feedback on EDI. But before I share any of that, I want to express to you a heartfelt thank you to all of our board members, our superintendent, our staff our teachers, you guys have a really hard job, a really hard job. Our parents recognize that. You have to consider things from the national level, the state level, the county level, and then use them to solve local issues. That's hard. When the rubber meets the road, that's really hard. I'm very excited and optimistic about some of our new programs that we're rolling out because like every parent, I want to see them be successful, as I know all of you do as well. Today, as an Italian-American, is very special to me because not a lot of people know that Columbus Day was actually founded in 1892 by President Benjamin Harris as a response to the worst lynching in U.S. history in 1891 of 11 Italian immigrants. My great-grandfather, my grandparents, and my parents have all been marginalized at a point in their life. I want to make sure that underrepresented children in our district and families have a voice. The concern that I have is how we roll things out. And Dr. Ramey, you said it very well. The plan's one thing, but what really happens when we put it in action? Um, really do appreciate the communication that's improved on this the last couple of weeks. I know the website's been updated. There have been some really good emails that have come out that I know lots of parents have read. Uh, read the uh, article in the Dayton Daily. Thank you for doing that. The concern that I have is when we roll something out for a portion of our constituency, are we creating unintended consequences and obstacles for other portions of our constituency, maybe even a larger portion of that group? That's a real concern. And the heart of my uh, desire to share with you tonight was actually captured very well by a candidate uh, for the school board over the summer when she said, in public school, you don't get to pick and choose. That's scary for a parent like me. If I don't meet the national narrative, do I have a voice here? I am very appreciative of this opportunity to be able to speak to you tonight. 
And I would encourage the school board to continue bi-directional conversations between the district and all of our parents. There's a lot of tension actually on these subjects, which is unfortunate. Sometimes the education or the information that you can provide kind of helps ease that tension a little bit. And I would truly ask that you continue to find ways to get our feedback on these things. I think the greatest way that we can improve these things that we roll out is to get preemptive information out to parents for their decisional inputs. Maybe some parents were discouraged two weeks ago when the Secretary of Education said for Commerce, or excuse me, would not uh, affirm for uh, Congress that ch uh, parents are the primary stakeholders in a children's life. That gives thanks to a parent like me, because like all of you, I'm here because of our schools. And, thank you. And what it provides for our children. I don't just want to talk about it, though I want to be about it. So if there's something that I can do to engage with you on a more frequent basis, on a regular basis, some kind of um, way that we can gather feedback and provide it to you, I think that will go a long way towards healing some of the tension on this. Clarity on just the, even a couple uh, uh, points. What are we going to do about the honor system? What are we going to find after we perform an audit on that? What are we going to do about our facilities? Those are two just uh, many questions that parents have that we're very concerned about, especially for somebody like me who has small children. I really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me speak. God bless. Jenny, there she is. I am here. Excuse me. Um, first, thanks for allowing me this opportunity, Tracy, for squeezing me in at the 11th hour. Thank you very much. She got my email at 6 so thank you. Um, I want to echo his comments about how I appreciate your job as hard. You can't please everybody all the time. But tonight I wanted to bring up a topic that I think needs to be addressed. Um, and that is, there's a significant level of subjectivity in determining the severity of the code of conduct violations and also the consequences that are imposed on those violations. Currently, this determination of the severity of a, what the violation is and the consequence falls into the hands of four people. Um, when allegations and consequences are considered severe in the eyes of these four individuals, or three, there should be, in my opinion, a second, a second level independent anonymized review because the fallout from these types of situations can and often have a significant impact on the student's future, either academically, athletically, even emotionally. I say this knowing that, okay, I'd like to see a policy enacted that makes the process more objective so that our school community, parents, students, teachers, everyone can be confident that the administration is acting in a fair, accurate, consistent, and non-discriminatory manner when they are actioning these situations. I know you came with some questions. Thank you, Tracy, for reminding me. Um, but some of the questions I have that have uh, come up recently is, and that would apply to this if we enact the policy, is do we keep records? of the reported and or observed code of conduct violations and the consequences that were imposed. Is there a policy that allows for an auditor or an independent reviewer to review these reports and consequences anonymously? I get that. We can't have students' names uh, in the hands of people that aren't uh, connected. And then similar to keeping records of the reported observed and um, reported and observed violations. Do we keep records of appeals? 
And if we do, similar to the reports and violations, um, is there a policy that would allow for an independent reviewer to come in and see if we are acting in a fair and accurate, consistent and non-discriminatory manner? Um, I do have a couple questions I know you can't answer, but I would like this to be on record. Is it standard procedure for the interviewer to remind a student of their Miranda rights when they are being questioned about a situation that has occurred during an investigation of a violation, perceived violation? And then I would also like to know if, and if there is, a policy for students to have a parent or an adult present when they are being questioned about a perceived or potential violation. Thank you, mm -hmm. Okay, last question. Yeah. Tonight's curriculum showcase uh, show uh, was put together by two of our English teachers for junior high and right here in Hopper. And one of the um, techniques or learning methods that they use is shared inquiry. I uh, just wanted you to see one more technique that um, our folks are using in their English department. So they put together um, a show for tape for us. So. Students are asked. 
to reflect on the discussion, not only on how it went, but also how they added to or changed their thinking based on the discussion. Hello, um, I'm Annie Williams, and these are my thoughts on shared inquiry. So last year, um, it really helped because it helped me to hear everybody's um, point of view and what we're reading about at the time. And it can really like broaden to views and really it changed my a lot of the times so it goes a lot more in depth. Um, for me, I remember we, I know Ellie said something about this, but we watched, we read a story called, uh, called The Old Man of the Sea, and it was really, really confusing. So being able to discuss it with everybody else really, really helped me understand it more. And personally, I'm a very outgoing person, so being able to be in a group of people like that really helped me improve, um, like sharing, stuff like that. And also, like, that's kind of where I strive. So being able to be in a group like that is really, really nice. So yeah. Good. So interpretive questions are really the heart of a shared inquiry discussion, and there are a lot of reasons that interpretive questions are great, but um, two of my favorites are that it really forces kids to find and explain evidence that supports their ideas, and also to consider different interpretations of that evidence. And one of my favorite things about shared inquiry discussions is that it truly embodies the idea of student-led. While there is an interpretive question to start the discussion, as the discussion evolves, and perhaps I have follow-up questions, the students create their own follow-up questions, and through the evidence they share and how they explain it, really determines how their understanding and the discussion will unfold. And now we're going to hear from Kelly. Um, one thing I really enjoyed about the class discussions from last year are being able to share thoughts and hear what others thought. So, like, you could share what you interpreted, and then other people could share what they interpreted, and they could be like comparing and contrasting your guys' ideas. Um, I liked the sharing inquiries because it gave you a guide to the answer, and it wasn't necessarily like a right or wrong. You just took the evidence in the text, as long as you used that and the answer could be correct because it was comprehension and basically your train of thought of how it, you thought it was. Um, the annotations really help because they helped guide uh, my ideas and thoughts and it led you to like a conclusion, like the annotations could help as you read them or as you like wrote them down, it made you think about what you were reading and really made you think about what really was going on and that usually helped read to the answer or like your answer because there's not necessarily one answer. I felt like my, my my voice was important to the class discussion because someone could always like piggyback off what you said and then you could piggyback off what they said because I like, keep sharing your ideas and keep going. Um, um, it gave me a deeper understanding of the text because it made me think about what was really going on and it just helped. And two of the lines that we really like this from the which they came to again because it had multiple different perspectives in America is a lot of why I love the shared inquiry teaching model is because talking equals learning and in an English classroom discussion is at the heart of that learning. And in the shared inquiry discussion model, there are no wrong answers, just answers supported by evidence from the text, which helps students grow as thinkers and learners and appreciate their voice and others. And I really love shared inquiry because it motivates our students to closely read complex text so that they can find excellent evidence to support their thinking. It promotes critical thinking and it really allows for engaging meaningful discussions in our classrooms. Dr. Lang, thank you for supporting this curricular initiative. We really do love it and we look forward to seeing how it evolves with our students in the coming years. Hi, I'm Nadine Hoffer, and this is Ann White here, and we teach English at Wilfwood Junior High, and we're going to share a little bit with you tonight about um, shared inquiry. Ann and I went to... Okay. <laughs> Let's see here. Or, uh, just point out, so our production uh, king over there, me, is, she's, she's doing great work managing the camera managing all the tech the zoom meeting at the same time uh, that's that's a lot that, that's a lot so thank you tracy for keeping us straight and not tripping over the cord we appreciate that thank you 
board reports. I got one. Give me an eye, Mr. Wilson. Let's go. All right. This is uh, from the Oakwood Schools Foundation, uh, the Flourish campaign public launch. The Oakwood Schools Foundation has publicly announced Flourish, a campaign for the performing and visual arts at Oakwood Schools uh, at Comeback Lumberjack on October 1st. On the top uh, on the, of the top curriculars and co-curriculars, including athletics, the arts made up five of seven and highest participation rates among Oakwood junior high and high school students. <coughs> Flourish is a 100% private fundraising effort to raise $8.8 .8 million for new ad for new uh, and enhanced state-of-the-art facilities in the junior high and high school to elevate uh, and celebrate the arts in Oakwood and to help our students remain competitive in their pursuits. Over $5 million has been raised for the project with the goal to break ground in June of 2022. Uh, special commemoration spaces are available. For more information, please visit the campaign website or reach out directly to the Oakwood Schools Foundation. Uh, the seventh annual Comeback Lumberjacks, uh, presented with or presented by Jessup Wealth Management, took place Friday, October first. The event was well attended by alumni and community members. The event was hosted at the Dayton Country Club at 9 p.m. Kevin Jones, vice chair of the board and chair of the Flourish Steering Committee, publicly announced the capital campaign to the public. It was an exciting event, and OSF is already looking forward to the next year. Uh, homecoming Tours, an amazing group of student alumni ambassadors hosted Homecoming Tours at Oakwood Junior High and High School. The year's cohort of students alumni ambassadors is the largest in the program's history. Uh, the tour included presentations from uh, Mr. Brian Hart, Ms. Jennifer Gabbard, and Ms. Heidi Edwards, and also perform live performances from Oakwood students at the band and the fine arts. Attendees were also able to view plans for the upcoming fine arts and visual arts enhancement. There you go. Thanks, John. Who wants to follow that? I don't think so. I'd be happy to be done. <laughs> uh, budget and finance. Is it Gina or Gina? Yes. Gina. Okay. <laughs> Recommendation to approve the certified substitute daily. Great as follows, effective October 18th, 2021. Yeah, please have a motion to approve the recommendation at 5A. Summit. Second. Gina. Ms. Starr? Aye. Mr. Duo? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Schwederman? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Hey, can I just share a little bit there? Um, and this is something that Mrs. Couch is. Uh, running to front and center on is the number of substitutes that we have in our in our district and, uh, not necessarily to attract folks because uh and i, I don't remember the exact bump of day twenty dollars maybe a day um it isn't going to bring somebody out of the woodwork and go oh, now i'll do it kind of a thing but it's, it's much more about retaining uh, the people that we have and uh, understand that Districts all around the state here to read it all over the place and uh, across the nation. Less people want to sub for lots of reasons, but uh, a couple of our speakers talked about how hard the jobs are. The classroom job, uh, working with students, uh, managing and doing it, uh, the, the challenges in the classroom continue to be more. And with quarantines, with COVID, with uh, uh, you know, having to stay home, and take care of your own children, those kinds of things. We, our, our subs are even more and more valuable as to what's, what's happening in the classroom. So this is a small token in, in that direction, but it's very much about, there are, I forget the exact number, Mrs. Couch, maybe, but maybe a third less. Uh, yeah, sub. probably in the last three years. Yeah, Kevin Miller shared that at that state conference. It's, so less people want uh, yeah. are taking the sub license, and then there are less people getting into education in general, which yeah. long term is very concerning. Uh, that you think about the number of kids that are entering into the profession, there aren't very many that are actually going and doing that. There are a few, and they're they're good ones, but um, it's it's a real issue. So subs. And, Right. Teaching in general. The sub shortage other districts have been feeling it for the past few years. I think it's just now finally getting to us. Um so yep. 
Jeff, you're going to do 5B? I am going to do 5B. There's a motion on the table for a finished report. Okay. Please have a recommendation to approve the record. A motion to approve the recommendation at 5B. So moved. Second. Gina. Can we have some discussion yeah. before you take Before we vote, sure. Yes, sir. So say, um, I'm going to do part of it, and Tiffany's going to do part of it. Um, I'm going to talk about the debt refunding that happened this past Thursday on October 7th. We had the opportunity to refinance some debt. It was about $4 million in debt, um, and this is due to low um, financing rates. Um, it was originally issued around 2013, and it's just a portion of the debt. Um, we were able to save the taxpayers more than $200,000. Here's a check. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, let's make a deal. But um, this is the check um, to the citizens of Oakwood School District. The savings that we received on this debt refinancing doesn't come back to the district. It goes back to the taxpayers in, in terms of lower levy rates. Right. Um, we were able to get a rate of 0.66. The original issuance was between 2 and 2.75%. So um, we were really excited about that, and we we're fortunate to have the opportunity. We have to stop because we have to, Tracy wanted a photo off, and I want this photo. John, stay there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to join me now. Uh, yeah, I need both of you. I just think it bears mentioning how we go about establishing what our budget is um, and what the district has um, that kind of goes into that process. And so um, I wanted to just take a couple minutes and mention that the district has what we call a 10 year master plan. It's a programmatic look at our budget and our finances. Uh, we meet with our, our directors and our budget managers. We compile uh, what they expect to need, where we are, what our what our trajectory is, what our program initiatives are. We lay out a budget, like I said, that's programmatic. Um, and from that, we land on what the budget is. It's staffing, it's curriculum, it's student services, it's transportation, all of those pieces. Um, technology is a big one. Um, and they all go into a 10-year plan. The board then reviews that 10-year plan and we land on what a budget is. The formality that the board takes for the budget is actually the appropriations measure, which we did in June, that gives the authority then to the finance department and then to the district for purchasing. Um, we then lay that out and it becomes what we call a, a monthly report. So the board then knows when we say we're, our collections are running ahead of schedule, what that means. And we all know the impact it has on our, our tenure report, or our tenure plan. If we're running um, ahead of budget, right, the board understands what that means. And so it's important that everybody understands how those two work together. They're, the monthly report is a direct feed off from the annual budget that the board establishes at the beginning of the fiscal year. We also have a 10 year comprehensive capital plan. And we meet with budget directors on that as well. And it feeds, the, the two feed together to be a resource alignment. Uh, and it's very strategic in how we go about doing that. And so I think it bears mentioning um, for this group and for the people here that um, both in attendance and um, online, how the, how the board goes about setting budgets. I wanted to take just a quick second to take the board and um, the participants here to the website to show where you can find this information. So Tracy has it up on the website or on the screen. Tracy, I'm going to let you talk as you go. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So we have been doing some financial updates and you can find those on the treasurer's page as well. That is under um, the district, if you just search treasure, it will take you here. Um, so you can get, you can see the updates about uh, the ESSER funds and different things that, that are there. So we've been updating those on a regular basis. Uh, the five year forecast that is submitted each um, time it is due, and you can see it's, we have the past three on the board as well, on the uh, website as well. But I think uh, what probably gets updated the most are the mo monthly financial reports. The ones that are presented to the board 
have always been on board docs and they've always been on the website, but I don't know if everyone knows they are there. So you can go through board docs or you can go through this page. And when you go to monthly financials off this page, again, it's going to take you to board docs. Sorry, it's a lot running on this computer all the time. And then uh, you can see 2019, 2020, 2021. And um, so this is a rolling report. So if you go to that, even though it says September, that is just the latest figures. You can see the bank reconciliation is there and then below, and because it's a two-pager, um, but you can print it and download it and flip it also. But if you can see, um, each of the months are there and it has all the different categories and um, revenue and expenses. So again, you can get to it through board docs or you can get to it through our website but it will continue uh, to update. So don't let September, it's not just September, it's every month prior to September as well. So um, we will continue to keep those on there and uh, provide information on the website. Questions? Not a question, but just a... Uh, Maybe just to amplify a point, how the board of the district have intentionally moved away from what has always been kind of a um, obligation to file a five-year forecast, which didn't lend to as much strategy as we hoped to leverage. Um, and so, as an example of this check, that refinancing, having a ten-year forecast, having a ten-year capex plan, forces us to look at things in components more holistically and leverage them over time when it presents itself. So we file the five-year forecast to comply with you know regulatory but we do the 10-year forecast to make sure that we're doing right by our taxpayers and our, our community so, and that is how we manage and that is how yeah. we work through the district it is the 10-year plan and to your point on i think the five-year forecast which is due next month and will be will be um up for review that's our compliance tool and so we welcome any questions or feedback anybody may have about that but um all of that documentation all of that collaboration happens months in advance and then throughout the course of the year, we work together as a team to come up with resolutions and problem solving and all of those um, fun things on um, finance folks like to do. Well, a, a few years ago, we, we pivoted towards a shared resource center. And it's not just a reflection as to why, but it's one moment in time as to why. But it's, it's a nice reflection and not as to why we moved to the shared resource center. So Gina and Tiffany and Dan in the back, uh, thank you. Because I think it makes a difference. It makes a big difference. And I'd like to add too that, that this is also for it, this helps us take a look at levy cycles as well, because one of the biggest struggles that we've had is to get off this three year rotation. And that five year forecast never gave us a tool to take a look at that because it was only for five years. And so, uh, one of the biggest things I've seen out of this is our ability, because of what Mr. Duell was just talking about was taking a look at a moment in time and, and trying to increase that level cycle, cycle by a third. I mean, if we could do that for our community, that is one of the big things that we've been struggling with for years, really, is to try to get out of this, uh, this three, uh, three year cycle. So, so this tool is really you know, valuable for the entire community. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I need a vote to call the vote, Gina. Mrs. Carr? Aye. Mr. Duvo? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Schneider? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Great, thank you. Any unfinished business? Any new business by the board? Hearing none, Dr. Ramey, Administrative Reports and Student Center Recommendations, please. Sure, item 8A, recommendation is made to approve the attached agreement with Shared Resource Center to provide attendance and residency services. Motion please to approve the recommendation at 8A. Second. Gina. Mrs. Dar? Aye. Mr. Duo? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Schwederman? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Item 8B is uh, information. It's just an overview of the plan of uh, for access and success for all and we spent uh, quite a bit of time in our work session uh, reviewing that and talking about that, but I'll just hit the top of the top of the waves. Um, one is to thank the great work of the task force of the Board of Education of the administrative team who have done an awful lot 
to bring that to at least this this chapter or this part of it, first part of the plan. Uh, also, to all the feedback that we've received from our internal internal and external stakeholders, I think that's an important piece of that and understanding that. We did share this week uh, a general introduction letter, uh, the slides that help explain what, what this culture piece looks like and some of the action steps that are going to be part of that. Uh, we sent it out also in newsletters as to the links to make sure that you know, those folks that didn't uh, see the first release or in the superintendent's message. And then also the Dayton Daily News article was a piece of that and talked about our guiding principles and shared those components. Our website is, is excellent. It continues to evolve and shift. Uh, it has a lot of resources and we've been evaluating that and adding some and, and looking at how that all fits and making sure that it is something that it shares a, a, a balanced look. Uh, it also allows or is a spot where families can go and use and evaluate. Does that make sense? And those teachable moments that present themselves at home all the time. So I think those things are important. Uh, the slides are available there as well. And then um, our next steps in general are to take those, those steps in there, those action items, and then how, what's that going to look like in the class or in the classroom and the uh, hallways and uh, the HR recruiting pieces, all of those components that are all part of that. What's that going to look like? And that's what that's what we're going to be working on from here on out. Uh, that's all available on the uh, website. And I think that's just an overview of where we are and what, what we're doing. Certainly appreciate the support of, of the board and what's, what's happening there. Thank you. Welcome. The item 8C presented for review is a policy of 237001. The plan is to make the recommendation to adopt this policy at the November 15th board meeting. That was attached. I'll turn it over to Allison. Uh, just to talk a little bit about the uh, enrollment of home education and community schools sure. special ed scholarship program. Sure. So to give everyone an update, um, so last year was a little a uh, unique year. So home education, we had 134 students who um, filled out the the home education notification form. This year we have 46, um, and that fluctuation, we had 30 students continue on home education. Typically, we were around that 18 to 20 mark um, every year. So that is still a little bit higher. I do think some students are doing home education and families are shocked that it's actually working and they like it and they think it fits. Um, also just ebbs and flows if you have a whole family going through and they have some graduate or they move. Um, so for home education, this year we have 46 students um, doing home education. Um, this year, 30 students continued with home education. We had 16 new students, and my assistant, who really does keep track of the numbers much better, that really is only a few families, but we have three or four kids each um, in that. 82 students returned to Oakwood. Um, 18 students moved. Um, we had that quite a bit with military families who homeschooled for a while and they were going to be transitioning. Um, so we have 18 students move, and then we had six students who enrolled elsewhere, which you'll see in the community numbers, whether that be STEM, Ohio virtual, because you had some of those start to go virtual, and then we had one student graduate from home education. Um, community school enrollment, last year we had 20, 20, uh, the 2021 20, school year. Um, we had one student that was in a community school. Homeschool was the way a lot of our families went versus the online. Um, this year, we have quite a few more who have gone to Ohio virtual, um, Stivers, STEM, those pieces. Special Education Scholarship, which is the John Peterson and the Autism Scholarship. We have three students um, whose parents have chosen to participate. Um, and then we have four tuition students who are attending Cyber School for the Arts. It's kind of a breakdown of some of our. 
Nice job. You're on a roll. I think you should just keep going. Keep going. Okay. So, some updates on state and federal funders. So, we have it's item E and F. Um, so let me all start with a, a breakdown. So our federal grants include Title I, which um, maybe some of the parents hear about that. We have Title I reading. Um, you have Title II, which is improving teacher quality. Um, you can use this funding to help reduce your class sizes and those pieces. Um, we have Title IV, which we, we get a little bit of money in, which is about academic enrichment student support. Then you have IDEA Big B is what it's called. So it's for special education. Um, and then we have, it's early childhood. It's another form of IDEA Little B. Um, and we get about 6,000. Total and federal grants, we get $624,274. Um, Last year, and I think that is almost identical to last year. Last year, we were $624,041. So almost identical to last year. Um, but Gina and I will rarely get notices because they'll give us more money and they'll drop it in. And then you have to go through the CCIP and reallocate your money and do that. But we are almost um, exactly the same as last year. Um, we use this a lot to pay for salaries, um, which is actually like when you look at uh, item F, when we look at the ARP, IDAB use of the funds, um, that's a new category and they are regularly coming out with new categories of that we have to figure out, okay, they drop in funds and you have a, a program that you work through and tell them how you wanna spend it and put it into categories and pieces. Gina really helps run point on that. We also work with Montgomery County ESC, um, the loss endowment to help us write those grants and get that done. I'm just the point kind of for our district on this piece. She's the financial point. <laughs> okay, Thanks, here we Allison. go. You're welcome. Dr. Raymond, personnel items, reservations on rewards. Great. Uh, and not a whole lot going on. We're well into the uh, to the school year, but we do have a few items. Uh, 9A, if we can take nine up, items 9A along with items 10A through D at the same time. Uh, may I please have a motion to approve the recommendations of 9A and 10A, B, C, and D. So moved. Second. Gina. Mr. Aye. Mr. Duo. Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Schuderman? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Great. Would you take some executive session? Recommendation is made to take care of this executive session for the specific purposes of the appointment of a public official, the appointment of a public official. Our compensation of a public employee or regulated individual is to consider matters required to be kept confidential by federal law or regulations of state statutes. Does have a motion to move into executive session? So moved. Second. Gina? Mrs. Dar? Aye. Mr. Dula? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Schwederman? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Great. Thank you. The board will now move into executive session and uh, upon the end of the executive session, we will adjourn without taking any further action on behalf of the board of the district. That concludes this evening's public meeting. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. Get out of the boat.